Hi, welcome back to part four. This is part four on determinate music. Determinate, what does that mean? Well, it contrasts indeterminate music. Indeterminate music, you know, a lot of musicians and composers think of as music that can invite improvisation or music that can invite sort of spontaneous decisions that change the sound of the music. So it doesn't actually really sound the same way twice. Um, jazz improvisation is highly indeterminate music. When I use my sound sculpture that I talked about in part three of, uh, of the sounds on her video, uh, what I was doing was uh, sharing with you an instrument that is also used for improvisation, things where I just kind of spontaneously invent. Uh, this piece that I want to share with you, aphasia, is a determinate piece of music, which is to say I try to actually do it the same way every time. That's a very different kind of discipline when you try to do things the same way. And many of you are familiar with that. I mean, you often do this. Okay, so that was, uh, that was, I didn't, I didn't compose that. That was Beethoven. Okay, and a lot of people would like to play it that way because that's kind of the, well, not, I'm better than me because I really am not that attached to the classical repertoire, but more or less like that, those notes, those pitches, those rhythms. Whereas I might take... The point is, I've just taken a piece that is typically determinate, and I've made it indeterminate by improvising in a jazz on it in a jazz idiom. Okay, that's not what we're doing in this next section. This is about this piece called aphasia, and it's for hand gestures synchronized to two-channel audio. And again, as I said, I'm trying to do it the same way twice. It's really hard, this piece. Um, I, let me just play a little bit of the opening. The sounds that you're going to hear are from audio made exclusively from one singer. So I recorded a friend of mine who's a great singer and he made all these weird vocal sounds in my home studio and then later I took those sounds and I cut them up and mixed them up and I did crazy computer manipulations to them to make this sort of like so-called, you know, sort of tape as we used to call it tape, now it's like fixed media, CD audio or an MP3 or whatever. But the point is, that's a fixed thing, that's determinate, that doesn't change. When I press play, on my laptop, which I'm going to do in a moment, it's going to play the same way every time, unless something's wrong with the technology. So that's a determinate electronic soundscape that you're going to hear, and to that I've choreographed certain hand gestures, and I'm trying to do them the same way every time. And I'm hoping that players who play this piece other than me, and so far amazingly there are several dozen who are interested in this piece throughout the world who are playing this piece, they kind of do it the same way that I do it as well. They have their own little spin on it, but not the little spin like on my, you know, the spin I took on Beethoven, okay? It's not that variable, all right? So this is a different kind of discipline. I'm saying a lot, I'm sort of talking a lot. I'm pretty verbose and loquacious and prolix here, and it's because I'm stalling, because I'm really scared of this kind of performance, because it takes a different kind of discipline. The spontaneous stuff I love, because I don't have to memorize anything, really. I mean, I kind of have to know something, and I can kind of make it up. Here, I have to do the, okay, no more stalling. Let's just play a little bit from aphasia. Okay, let's stop there. So that was a little bit of a, this introduction of what is essentially a nine minute piece. And by the way, you can watch the full piece on my Vimeo channel if you go to Mark Applebaum Vimeo. 
something like that with the Google or I don't know how it works. Anyway, the inter interweb. So you can find it there and you can watch the whole thing. All right. One of the things that you'll notice about this piece is another kind of discipline. I hadn't thought about talking about this, but I realized as I'm looking at the camera um, and like peering into your soul or something. It's a this is a really weird piece, okay? Because I'm just like flat affect. That's the idea. I really want you to concentrate on my hands. You know, ironically, actually, that really disturbingly flat affect that has no persona actually amplifies my face in a weird way. But the point is, I'm trying not to be histrionic or theatric or emote in a sense. I want you to just concentrate on the hand gestures and how they link to the sound. Okay, so that's just a little word, but that's an aesthetic decision. It's an artistic idea. I like that sort of blank facade. All right, that's the style of piece. Now, the more important thing with regard to discipline is I hope you notice that I'm trying to do this in a kind of mimesis. I'm trying to mimic the sounds in a certain way in exact unison with my hands. This is really hard. This is not music where you can count beats in a conventional way. It takes just a lot of time. I, I spent a year composing this piece and I, and, and I know the piece because I composed it, but then I spent four months of really hard work. Round, it felt like it was around the clock. It was a lot of like almost every waking hour for four months trying to learn and memorize all of these hand gestures and figure out how they go with this strange sound. It's kind of unconventional. There's not that many pieces. I mean, of course you can say, I don't mean to say that I'm like some super innovator. Uh, there's dance. I mean, we have lots of dance, we have ballet. So what I'm essentially doing is choreographing, but it's still a little bit strange as a music piece. And it's a little strange to have these kind of nonsense made up hand gestures synchronize the sound. So it's a little bit, I, I, I would, I'll stand by that. I think it's still kind of an unconventional musical pra practice compared to a lot of the other ones we have. But I'm trying to convey that it's very practiced, that it's very disciplined. I hope you could see that, that I've spent time figuring out how to get these little things exactly, you know, at the same time as the, uh, as the recording. And that's challenging and it's really, really, really hard. And it took me again about four months of just like almost nonstop iterations. It's just shedding, you know, there's nothing like practice. So that's something I did with this piece. Um, the piece consists of uh, a long, this is impossible to read, but I, there's a, the point is it's one page of many in the appendix that describe every single gesture and describe all the ways in which that like all the hand gestures work. They define it with these various uh, descriptions and, um, and so there's page after page of that. And then of course there's the score and there's page after page of something that looks like this where I see the waveform, the kind of the amplitude of the electronic tape part. And then there are little pictographs that show the different kinds of hand gestures and I have meter and tempo and so forth. So in some ways it's a conventional musical score, but it's one that explains the choreography and the tape. So in a sense, this is once again an invention of a discipline in an unconventional space. It's an unconventional cultural space, that is to, to say, the space of pieces that are about hand gestures synchronized to sound. Not that many, I suppose, uh, at least by comparison. But I have to figure out how I'm going to learn this thing. And I'm learning this, which is a piece that the space necessitates a determinate response. So once again, it's a fixed response. What I'm trying to do is to do something the same way twice. And that's really against my nature, to be honest, in many respects. Originally, I didn't imagine that I was going to learn this piece. I was going to give it to other people, and then I was told it's impossible, so it was kind of like a challenge, and so then I learned it. I kind of got coaxed into showing that this is actually possible. And now, as I kind of alluded to earlier, there are dozens of people around the world who are playing it, and that delights me that they're dealing with this, and they're, they're, they're dealing with this piece, and they're trying to you know, discover their own discipline. Um, so it's necessitating a determinate response. That is, it is not improvised. Okay, that's just about everything that I wanted to say and share with you on some different facets of my own musical practice and how discipline is a part of them in different ways. And I'm hoping that you can adapt this to your own, you know, uh, solo harmonica career or bluegrass mandolin playing or your Balinese gamelan band uh, or your Hindustani raga aspirations or, you know, maybe you do Mozart. I don't know, it's up to you. You're weird, you can do Mozart, fine. Anyway, the point is, you know, adapt this to your own thing, really get into it, think about what the issues are, and, um, and now a coda. Yeah, so here's a coda. 
Am I entitled to a code? I think I'm entitled. Okay, I'm gonna do a coda anyway. I don't care if I, I'm just gonna keep talking. Are there any more video crew people here? I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so what I wanna to say to you is have fun, be creative, and especially happy inventing. That's what I wanna tell you, happy inventing. Be inventive with, and that doesn't mean inventing a new instrument, but be inventive and creative in your musical pursuits. But also there's something that's paired with, which is this, happy practicing. So invent something, but then practice it, okay? Come up with something new, but then apply the appropriate kind of rigor to it. And then just repeat. Keep going, happy inventing, happy practicing. And I leave you with that. And so from all the folks at Speak Percussion and the uh, Sounds Unheard series, um, I thank you and I wish you luck in all the music that you make.